Hi everyone, thank you for joining. I'm just going to give it one more minute just to let a couple more people kind of pour in. Okay, right. Hi everyone, good evening. Um, thank you for joining this third session in our Welcome to Rail series, which is run in partnership with Young Rail Professionals and Network Rail. So this session, uh, we're looking at the life cycle of a train and we've got some really, really great speakers here today. We've got people from Alstom, CPC Project Services, Greater Anglia and the MTR Elizabeth Line. So we've already had two sessions of this series. So we've heard from a couple of people about the history and the future of the UK railway. And last week we heard from a few kind of railway leaders, including Andrew Haynes of Network Rail. And they spoke about the um, current challenges and opportunities that are facing the industry at the moment. So before I hand over to Network Rail to do some more opening remarks, I'll just do some quick kind of housekeeping and say a few words about young rail professionals. So just to quickly give credit where credit's due, um, I'd just like to talk about people that are behind this great initiatives. So we've got Full Case, who's in the background of this event today. He's head of initiatives within yep, YLP, and he's also a project manager at CPC Project Services. Uh, we've also had Jacob Cooper, who is networking development manager at YLP, and he's also a program manager at Network Rail. And there's myself up in the corner. So I am Rail Week and Interrail manager at YLP, and I'm also a policy executive with the Railway Industry, Industry Association. Um, from the Network Rail side, we've had Mark Hodgson, who's Head of Talent and Organisational Development, and we've also worked with Erica Diaz, who's Talent Consultant from Network Rail. And today we've got Emma Pickup, who's going to be doing the Network Rail opening remarks. So just to give you a quick overview of YLP, we're a not-for-profit organisation, we're all volunteers, um, so we will give up our time outside of our day jobs to do this. Um, membership is completely free. If you're not already signed up to YLP, I fully recommend you have a look at the website. You can just look at our kind of information, all the events that are coming up, including the kind of future sessions of the Welcome to Rail program. Uh, I've got loads of members, got over five and a half thousand people across the country and I think worldwide. Uh, CPD accreditors, if you're trying to get chartered, some of our technical events are really useful for that. And we've also been going for about 12 years now. So if you join YLP, you're part of a great network across the country. Ooh. So just quickly talk about our kind of pillars and what we stand for. So we promote young people within the industry. We kind of stand to kind of promote the achievements, the importance of young people. We try to inspire the younger generations. We show the kind of broad range of opportunities within rail and the kind of breadth of careers there are. And we also develop, so we de help to de develop the kind of new generation of railway professionals put on like development events, networking events. Um, in terms of our values, we're inclusive, we kind of embrace everyone, everyone's welcome in YLP. Uh, we're signed up to an industry EDI charter. Uh, we're collaborative, so we have committees in each region and we all work together across each region of the UK and the nations, so uh, Wales and Scotland. Uh, we're committed, we look forward to the future of rail and we kind of promote the importance of young people in achieving that. Um, we lead by examples, we're proactive, visionary and we're accountable for our kind of actions and our events. And most importantly, we're fun, or at least we think we are. Uh, we put on lots of networking events. It's a really good way to just meet people, have a bit of fun outside your day job. So in terms of the initiatives, so Rail Week and Interrail, which is what I work on, we sit inside the initiatives function of YLP. So we also have a heritage rail function. So through that, we work with quite a few of the heritage rail companies across the UK, and we run kind of trips. So you can go and do like track renewals. I think next month, we're going to Fistiniog in Wales. Uh, we also have Young Rail Tours and another plug. They're going to the Isle of Wight next month. I think there are a few uh, spaces left on that, so please do go to the website to have a look. In the past, they've been to Japan and loads of other places. I've got the annual dinner, which is April every year. It's a really, really good event. It's a really good chance to get a bit dressed up, meet some other young people in the industry and watch some people win some awards. And it's always really nice. And it kind of alternates between London and the North every year. Um, so we also have Interrail, which is my area. So this focuses at going into kind of schools, universities and colleges and engaging with young people and kind of promoting kind of how exciting rail is as a career and just how many things you can do within it. And as part of that, we also have Rail Week, which is always run in October. And it's a week long event focused at kind of just 
having a big push on careers in rail, promoting it to school children, and just engaging with those schools and educational bodies. And yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Emma from Network Rail, who will talk a bit about Network Rail and their careers programme. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so yes, my name's Emma Pickup. I'm one of the talent consultants within Network Rail's national talent team. Um, so joining a new organisation can be a daunting prospect and the rail industry is no exception to that. So one of the biggest challenges that we can simply get to grips with how it all works, um, complicated jargon and acronyms aside, there are many organisations who work together across the industry to keep services running um, safely and for our passengers and freight users. Network Rail is very excited to have been working in collaboration with IRP to launch the Welcome to Rail induction programme. The more that you can learn, the better equipped that you can be to drive your own career journey and play a part in connecting and collaborating to shape and drive our industry. I hope that you can maximise this opportunity and get the most out of the sessions. Brilliant, thank you Emma. So I think now I'm handing over to Paul Case from RB to talk about the rest of the programme. Thanks Isabella and hi everyone, thanks for joining tonight. Um, yeah, so we have a pretty busy schedule of events coming up still ahead of this one. Um, as Isabella mentioned, we've uh, had two of our events so far, which were excellent and a very exciting event tonight. Um, next week on the 3rd of November, we've got uh, Staying on Track, which is an intro introduction to track and infrastructure. Um, and we have an incredible lineup from Network Rail across all their specialisms, talking about how the vast network of, of track and infrastructure in the UK is, is managed and maintained. And then following events, we've got an introduction to signaling control. Um, there will be a slight change in the programme here. We're then going to have modern innovation in UK rail um, and HS2, a case study, is going to be moved to the end of the programme. We'll be sending a notification out to that if you've signed up. Um, next, please, Isabella. So today's session, which is the life of a train, uh, which is looking at um, how trains come about from design through to depot. We've got a pretty amazing lineup of speakers. We've got Benjamin Parry kicking off events. He's a fleet performance manager at Greater Anglia and, and previous to that has a, a long history in the uh, industry. Um, speaking from Alston, we've got Elizabeth Elliott and Callum Geary. Uh, Geary sorry. Uh, Charlotte Hughes, who's an Associate Director of Rolling Stock at CPC and has also introduced new trains uh, across various lines, most recently Southwest Rail. And joining us later, we've got David Pierce, who's a 345 Delivery Manager for MTR Crossrail. And he'll be talking about um, how depots and maintenance works within MTR and also giving a virtual tour of the depot. Um, in terms of event timings, so Ben will be starting the event next after me, um, and we'll have time for questions after that, followed by Elizabeth and Callum, who'll be talking about designing, manufacturing, and maintaining trains. Uh, Charlotte will be talking about how to introduce a new fleet. We've got then David, as I mentioned, followed by closing remarks. Just a note on housekeeping, if you have any questions for our um, speakers during the event, if you could drop them into the question box, um, I'll then pull them out and ask on your behalf after each presenter has spoken. Um, and if you have any questions for any of us separately or any issues, please drop it in the chat box. Uh, you can either message uh, us individually or the organisers or send a message to the UNI group if you have something uh, to raise. So uh, with no further ado, I'll hand over to Benjamin Parry. Thank you. I'll make you the presenter, Ben. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'll just get my screen shared and then we'll kick off. OK, so my presentation this evening is called Why UK Trains Are Weird. And I suppose if you're new to the industry, the UK train just looks like a UK train, right? That's normal. If you've travelled a bit, you might realise that trains elsewhere are a little bit different and there's, there's some interesting reasons for that. So we'll walk through a few examples today um, and hopefully you'll uh, you'll never look at trains the same way again. Uh, before we do that, um, just very quickly who I am. Um, my background, um, so my career so far, last eight years, has been primarily in rolling stock design. Um, you'll hear from some of my old colleagues um, and friends a bit later from Elston. I was at Bombardier and Elston for the last eight years. Um, I've also done quite a lot of work looking at the passenger experience, particularly the digital passenger experience. Um, so yeah, sort of eight years in supply chain, 
uh, I sort of led the development of a high speed version of the event tra train from, from Alstom, uh, did that a couple of times. I then um, proceeded to um, have a key role on delivery of the train uh, which is right for those of you that aren't an anorak. Um, and then I did quite a lot of work on product innovation as well, specifically looking at digital experience, and that culminated in the development of um, a development vehicle, a, a showcase, a prototype, which is pictured in the middle. Uh, I now work in operations, took the decision to step over the divide, and I now work for, for Greater Anglia as a, a fleet performance manager. I'm sure most of you know about Greater Anglia. Anyway, without further ado, why are UK trains a bit weird? Well, I'm going to skip to the end, if you don't mind. I'm going to tell you why I think UK trains are a bit weird. And then we'll go through some examples of how that's manifested in itself in the way that trains in the UK sort of look and look. I think trains in the UK are weird for two reasons, right? The first one of those is historical. Because the birthplace of rail. You know, we we invented we invented the thing, and that should make us all feel nice and smug, um, and that's okay. But the reality is, we were, we were also the guinea pig. First railway anybody ever built. First public railway in the world was the Stockton and Darlington Railway, uh, so in the northeast of England, 1825, um, and that was the first one to use it. Designed by who uh, is, is, is fairly well known for his involvement. Um, that railway was a mixture of steam engines and horse-drawn stuff. So the first proper railway, if you like, that was fully steam uh, was Liverpool and Manchester in 1830. So throughout the 19th century, there was a lack of standardization. So there was a whole bunch of private companies all raced to build routes that ran parallel to each other and over the top of each other here there and everywhere and they were all built with different specifications so it wasn't a blank sheet of paper job with a with a macro helicopter view it was all done very in a very agile and very ad hoc way and, up, uh, and that manifests itself probably in the most extreme sense by the fact that up until the very very late 1800s we used two different track gauges so um, a third of the network used um, Brunel's broad gauge, which was about seven foot uh, wide. That was a great Western area, so Bristol and all around there. Um, and the rest was Stevenson's gauge, which was based upon the, uh, the uh, sort of minecart gauging in the Northeast. Uh, and that's the gauge we use everywhere now, 1,000. Um, the other important point from this time is that tunneling technology was really in its infancy. Um, and the maximum diameter that you could bore a tunnel was really quite and, and that still manifests itself today in trains and all of them those you'd find um, elsewhere we've busy build big tunnels. So I think that's one of the main reasons why our trains have ended up being a little odd. I think the other major reason is much more recent, which is prolonged privatization. So the UK has either privatized or attempted to privatize pretty much every aspect of railway one time or another. Um, now, when you look around the world, that approach is really unique. Most countries still have. Um, not only do we have a different approach, that approach has been in place pretty much until 1997, uh, sorry, since. Um, so we have quite a long time to observe the impact of that and how that's changed. Look and feel. You look for, Someone will have gone into detail in this one of your earlier sessions, but hopefully you now appreciate that instead of a single organisation like Deutsche Bahn or SNCF on the continent, um, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of companies in the UK. Each has a really complicated set, fairly contractual, contractual and um, and the way in which those relationships have to be commercial in this sort of private creation. Um, yeah, has effects on the way that trains are specified and manufactured. Or asterisk here, which is trains today look the way they do because of a long period of privatisation. You might have heard of this thing called Great British Railways that is coming along and the fact that the railway might start to move away from being privatised. 
that's obviously an asterisk and, and trains in the next 15 years might look different again as a result. Are any less valid for now? Ben, sorry. We've had a couple of comments and I'm getting it as well that your audio is a bit spotty. It keeps coming and going. Um, can you fiddle with your audio settings at all just to check it? Apologies for that. Uh, yeah, we did a test, didn't we? And it was okay. Yeah, so it keeps going in and out. Um, it's fine for a minute and then there's sort of five seconds of uh, can't hear you. Um, Ricky, really, you can't change the sensitivity on the microphone on um, GoToWebinar. You, know, you can only do that for the sound from what I can see. Yeah, I don't really know what I can do, Paul, to be honest with you. Can I just, just uh, maybe just slow down slightly um, and that might fix it. <laughs> Sorry to, to catch you in your stride. Um, no, no, that's fun. Just, uh, yeah. Maybe um, maybe it's going too fast for your microphone or something. I'll jump in if it's still if it's still being an issue. But um, yeah, just to be conscious of it. Apologies for interrupting. No, that's fine, mate. Thank you for letting me know. People people do need to be able to hear. Um, can you still see the screen? Yes. Yeah, you just need to go into presenter mode. Oh yeah. Cheers. Thank you. So. Um, so yeah, so I think every one of the um, physical examples that I now show you of um, features of trains, I think we can tie back to one of these one of these two things. We'll start with this. UK trains, well, they're, they're pretty tiny. And that means if you want to uh, sell a train in the UK or build a train in the UK, you can't just take one from somewhere else and plop it down here. It needs to be sort of custom designed and, and, and everything shrunk uh, down. And this is because, as we discussed a second ago, we have the oldest rail network in the world. Uh, we had to use tunneling technology that was Victorian. Um, and as a result, we have our the smallest, what is called loading gauge, which is the cross-sectional area in which the train needs to fit in order to not hit anything with respect to its track gauge. You see here very clearly left to right in the top right of the screen how uh, the loading gauge, the, si the allowable size of the train in cross section increases in other parts of the world. And the picture below, it's very rare to get a picture of a UK train and a, and a European train together for obvious reasons, um, but you can see a UK train uh, on the left, a Greater Anglia Flirt from Stadler, and a European gauge double deck uh, next to it, and there is a, a considerable distance in in, in uh, difference in size. Is the audio any better, Paul? Yeah, you had a brief cutout, but I think if you if you continue slower, it will be manageable, Ben. Yeah, it was only a, a second or two. Okay. Okay. Um, what you can see is a reduction in roof uh, height in the UK compared to other parts of the world. So that does make it challenging to integrate subsystems in that area. In the rest of Europe, it's quite common to have um, components on the roof. In the UK, we generally limit the components up there to either being an air conditioning system or the pantograph, which is having more power from the, the overhead. Uh, the overhead. Um, that reduction in space vertically, though, is actually less uh, of a challenge less different compared to the difference in width and hopefully you can see some of those dimensions on the screen um, our trains are very skinny that means that we we can't do proper two plus three seating if you ever see that the seats are artificially narrow we can only really do two plus two um, and for the height reasons we, can, we can't generally do double deck either uh, the most constrained area of all though is actually below the walking floor of the vehicle and um, what's called the lower sector gauge um, where the vehicle profile gets even narrower. So again, if you refer to those cross sections in the top right, you can see the, the Great British uh, section, which is the leftmost one of those. Um, towards the sort of the lower third of the profile, you get a step in, um, whereas every other profile continues pretty much straight down. Um, that, that is where most of the underframe equipment needs to be. Um, you know, the, the bogies, uh, electrical converter cases, um, toilet tanks, all that sort of stuff, and we are really tight in that, in that area. 
Okay. What, what else is a bit different about you? called an inside frame bogey, which is a, a direct response to something called the variable usage chart. And um, what is that? Well, that feeds into the, the second point we talked about before, which is all about privatization of the rail sector. Privatization of the rail sector um, and the need to have this contractual relationship between people. Fundamentally, your infrastructure owner, which when it was fully privatized was something called rail track, but the modern equivalent today is network rail, they need to find a way to create revenue because of this need to want to be private. And the way to do that is to effectively tax trains and buses. What the UC is, it's effectively a road tax on your car. Um, and the charge is calculated based upon how track friendly the train is and, and what sort of distance it's traveling. And it looks at several premises in doing that. Um, but, but one of the major factors in that is something called the primary sprung mass, which is Broadly speaking, the weight of the goal. As a result, most on the goal train manufacturers now delivering products into the UK have to have what's called an inboard bearing bogey. What that means is, you can see in the image there, you can see the wheels really clearly. There's no massive frame um, holding it all together. The frame is inside of the wheels, um, hence why it's called an inside frame bogey. And it's very slight, very, very, um, very light. If you were to look at an old style bogey, I perhaps should have thrown one in here, you wouldn't be able to see those wheels pretty much. There'd be an enormous frame all the way, all the way around it. And that's how it would look in, in Europe um, and, and any other country worldwide, basically. Um, and this is all important because to the to the train operator, whilst it's the smallest or one of the smallest slivers of their operating cost, higher pie is measured in hundreds of millions of pounds, which it often is that um, light grey track access slice is still worth millions and millions of pounds. By moving from a conventional bogey to an inside frame bogey, you could slash 30-40% out of that. So we're talking about millions of pounds worth of saving for the train operating company. Next thing that's a bit weird about the UK market is the low level of electrification. So this is all a bit small, but I'll walk you through it. So effectively, this is a a list of countries along the bottom, and then we've got the percentage of their rail network that is electrified up the slide. And I've got a line on here. So that's where the UK is, which is about, um, about only about a third of our network is electrified. And um, if you look at the countries below that line, it is pretty much um, Eastern European countries, by and large, with the exception of, say, Denmark and the Republic of Ireland. Um, most major developed advanced European economies have electrification significantly in advance of that. And if you look at the European average, which is the grey bar at the end, that's it's 55 percent. And we're considerably under the average. Um, it's an oddity given the, the you know, the GDP and, 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 and of, of our country. So what does that mean? Well, it allows for some innovative approaches to uh, propulsion and how we choose to have self-powered trains. Obviously, historically, if you didn't have overhead um, line available um, or some other electric source, infrastructure side, you would have a diesel train, right? Now, hopefully we all appreciate that, that the appetite for that is decreasing and there's an appetite to remove all diesel traction from the railway in the next sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, so that provides an excellent breeding ground for people to innovate. So there's things like the, the Stadler um, flirt being delivered to Transport for Wales, which has um, a mixture of hybrid and battery operation. Um, you've got the Alstom uh, breeze conversion, which is taking an old class 321 and modifying it with a hydrogen fuel cell propulsion system. You've got a similar situation with Porter Brook, who are uh, an asset owner, um, doing the same with a, with a legacy fleet there. Uh, and you've got the class 777 um, Stadler trains for mostly travel, which again have a dedicated battery raft to do short distances on battery power um, and for emergency use as well. And, and these are solutions that in some other countries in Europe, they're expensive rolling stock solutions. And most other countries that can afford those expensive rolling stock solutions will have already spent that money on electrification. So again, an oddity that's reflecting itself in UK train design. We then have two voltages in the UK. So we actually have 
despite having only electrified just over a third of our infrastructure, electrification is odd. So we have the world's um, largest 750 volt DC third rail network, uh, which is primarily in the south of, of the country, south of the Thames, going southeast and southwest. Um, Mercy Rail in Liverpool is the only exception to that. And that's where we have a, um, a, 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 a third physical rail at ground level that provides power to the, to the train. Uh, as a side point, the underground runs on a fourth rail system that's, that's very similar. And the rest of the um, network that's electrified has the overhead cables running at 25 kV AC. Um, so third rail DC, historically and the reason why it's seen quite widespread use in the uk is it used to be what still is a really cheap way to electrify and was seen for a long time as the most appropriate technology but in the modern world it has a low capacity there's a limit to the amount of power it can supply there's inherent safety concerns because it's at ground level which is where we're more likely to come into contact with it and you can't regen your energy back into the the grid under braking quite so easily so it's falling out of favor um, the, the challenge is that there's some places on our network where uh, we have trains that need to be able to flick between both of those uh, those types. And they're called dual voltage trains. What that means is, and this is probably the most technical we'll get, but the propulsion system on a train has like a base voltage that it uses and it sort of converts to and from that base voltage for all the various auxiliaries and various traction supplies that it has on it. And in Europe, that would be 1500 volt DC. Here, because we have a 750 volt DC third rail system, our DC link, the, the, the base um, the base heartbeat, if you like, of the train is matched to that. It's also 750 volt DC, which makes it much easier when you're running on the third rail system. You don't have to sort of convert back and forth. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer, can you tell? Um, but what that does mean is, Unfortunately, when we're operating in AC mode, um, the whole train is actually less efficient. Um, and if you would speak to a train designer from Germany or France, they would again find that odd. Um, but it's because of our infrastructure. Okay, final um, section from me, so nearly there. And um, the final odd thing about UK trains is the fact they have yellow fronts, or rather for 60 years they have. It's falling out of favour a, a little bit, but we're, we're getting there. Um, so because electric and diesel trains were much quieter than steam when steam was replaced, they decided to paint the front of trains yellow for, um, for safety reasons. And certainly for much of the British rail era, pre-privatisation, the entire front of trains was painted yellow. Um, and even as we moved into privatisation and we had all these different coloured trains for different train operators, um, there was a railway group standard, which was the, the old regulation system in the UK, legal legal system for the train um, requirements. It was required to be yellow. Over time, though, um, some derogations were, were sought to, to reduce that for branding purposes, and the amount of yellow on the front of trains was, was eroded away. Always there, but... Probably the most notable example of that was when Virgin wanted to put a, a Virgin Shield badge on the front of Pendolina and they had to seek a derogation to do that. Then, uh, much, much more recently, um, the latest group standard uh, came into force, which replaced uh, the earlier standard and um, required uh, TSI, Technical Standard for Interoperability. That's the latest set of railway standards across Europe. Uh, compliant headlamps, which basically means very bright LED, gave uh, people the opportunity to move away from a bright coloured front end because you have these high energy headlamps. Um, now, interestingly, just because the standards allowed for that change, um, some train operators who still have overall responsibility for the safety case uh, wanted to retain the yellow front. And you can see there that the real train that was built with the yellow front versus the rendering in the step before, which was shown as, as black. As operators have become more comfortable with that, actually, the yellow front is slowly becoming a thing of the past. And we now have plenty of fleets being introduced. Other colours uh, beyond yellow are being adopted for the, for the front of trains.
Um, and that's the final slightly weird thing about UK trains that I'm going to talk about today. So uh, thank you for listening. I apologise for the microphone issue. Um, I'm not sure what's gone on there. It usually works fine. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, please fire away. Hi, Ben. Thanks for that. And an excellent presentation as before. Even though I've seen it once already, it was still interesting. Um, we don't have any questions from the audience, but I'm going to open up to the other presenters uh, briefly to see if anyone has any questions from you. Otherwise, we'll move on to Callum and Elizabeth. So if any of the other presenters want to ask Ben anything while you've got the opportunity, um, jump in. If not, We'll take, we'll take that chance. Um, in, in, your audio definitely improved. Um, oh, hold on. Yeah, sorry, Anne, Matthew. Thank you, Ben. Can you go back to the charge? Uh, I think this is talking about the EV voltage. It cut out slightly. Could you just um, summarise that again slightly um, for one of the delegates? Yeah, which, which bit, Paul? Uh, the voltage, sorry. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, so so fundamentally um voltage wise in the uk we've got two voltages we've got the the overhead catenary voltage when you see the cables 25 kilovolts ac and then we have uh, alternatively um at ground level uh on a mainline train a, th a third rail it looks almost like a third running rail a big chunky metal rail at 50 volt dc supply um on the underground, you have a similar system again that's got a fourth rail, it's got two, two rails providing power uh, and two for um, running, but the potential difference is still 750 volts, so it's, it's an equivalent system. Um, the, the weird effect that has on UK train design is, that what, is, is the way that affects our propulsion system, the electric propulsion system on the train. So um, the propulsion system has something called DC link voltage, which I'm a mechanical engineer, not an electrical engineer. The best way to think about it is almost like the heart B or the, the base, the, the, the base um, nervous system of the train that we use, um, that we convert to and from anytime a system needs something else. Um, in the UK, we have that set at 750 volt DC as well. So it matches the 750 volt DC on the infrastructure. So you're not having to do too much conversion between the two. Um, in Europe, they wouldn't bother with that. They'd have a 1500 volt DC link voltage. Um, because that means you can have thinner cables, um, it's more efficient when you're operating an AC traction. Um, so we effectively, on a dual voltage train in the UK, we take an efficiency hit when we're running under AC for that reason, uh, but we have a slight efficiency boost when we're running under 750 volt um, DC. I, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Ben. And, and one more question has come in. Can you just explain the, I think it was the VCP again, the suppliers charge? Oh, the VUC, yeah, sure. Um, so VUC, variable usage charge, sometimes referred to as track access charge, sometimes referred to as VTAC as well. Um, so that is an amount that an operator will pay to network rail per, per mile, per vehicle mile. So for every uh, mile an individual carriage travels, they'll pay an amount in, in pence. And that amount is calculated according to a formula. That formula has multiple variables but it, it's primarily based on the, the mass of the train and the, what's known as the curving class of the bogey, so how, how easily the train goes around the, the, the track on a curve. Um, the mass of the train is split into three. You've got the unsprung mass, which is literally your axles, um, plus any, anything that's resting on those axles. You've got the unsprung mass, sorry, primary sprung mass next, which is pretty much everything on your bogey. And then you've got your secondary sprung mass, which is on top of your air suspension, which is generally the, the rest of your car. Um, the biggest impact on, on, on your VUC calculation after the, the unsprung mass, which is just your axles, you can't do much about that, is the primary sprung mass, the mass of the bogey, because there's very little suspension really between that and the tracks, which is quite a lot of damage. So if you can shrink that down, um, it has quite a big impact on the way the formula is calculated. So you can see a, a Maybe a 30 or 40 percent reduction in the total um, VUC cost. So it's 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 these days to be competitive in the UK market, you have to have that style of bogey. Otherwise, you will you will not be competitive. Thanks, Ben. We've had a couple more questions come in. Um, we probably have about five more minutes um, to, to not risk going too far over. Um, so the first one regards the uh, vertical platforms 
sorry, the horizontal platforms on the new Greater Anglia Stadler trains, which I'm very yeah. familiar with. Um, the question is, do you know if this is going to be the standard going forward, or was it just thinking on Greater Anglia's part? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. So, so for those that don't know, so so Greater Anglia uh, have bought, have replaced every train on their network with new trains. Um, and, and a portion of those are from a company called Stadler. Um, they have a lower floor height than is normal in the UK um, to, to better align with the, the platform height. Because usually, you, usually you step up into a train, right? So in this case, they brought the floor height of the train down to match the platform. Um, that also means because of curves and the way it all works, you have to you have to also bring the train away from the platform a bit. So what you what you save in height. Or what you gain in height you sort of lose you get a bigger lateral step from the platform horizontally so the way they've overcome that is by fitting a sliding step that moves out um to meet the platform which is brilliant so, so your platform train interface you, your typical mind the gap problem is pretty much eliminated it's brilliant um there are conversely there are some drawbacks to that and that's why it might not be adopted everywhere the first drawback to that approach um, is um, you've got a whole extra complicated system there that wears, has a reliability associated with it. Um, so, so there's more failure modes and more likely that, that, that there's a failure. And um, it also takes a, a while for the step to pull out. So that means um, what's known as the dwell time at station. So that the time the train is physically stationary before it sets off again is a little bit longer, which means you can run fewer trains through the station. Uh, and the third drawback, I give a balanced view of it. The third drawback, I mean, it's difficult to explain in, in a minute or two, but basically you 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 introduce a step inside the vehicle um, uh, as you move between the cars, as you go over the wheels, because getting the floor down low enough for the platform um, where your bogey is, um, you can't get the bogey that, that low either, so you have to sort of step up over the bogey at the car ends. So that introduces a step inside of the vehicle. Um, as opposed to having the step coming into the vehicle from the platform, if that makes sense. So you 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 have a different problem that you've moved, um, which which um, people are less used to. So you do see at the moment we are seeing a few extra trip slips and falls because people aren't used to having a step inside the vehicle floor, um, whereas people are very used to doing it at the platform interface. Um, yeah, but that's interesting. Thanks, Ben. I'm conscious we do have other questions, but in the interest of time, we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. If there is time at the end and Ben is still available, um, we'll go back to them. But otherwise, um, I'll see if we can, if Ben would be kind enough maybe to answer some via email. Um, I'll speak to him after this about that. Cool. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate that. We'll now switch over to Elizabeth and Callum to talk about uh, designing manufacturing trains. Let me just make you the presenter, Elizabeth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Let's do this. Has that worked? Just need to hit presenter mode. Thank you. Show mode, yeah. I am. Um... Technology is evading me today. Apologies, I'm going to flip presenter mode, but it's just not working. Um, That's fine, it's, it's legible like that if you want to kick off. Fair enough, thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Elliott and, uh, and, and Callum Geary it works with me at Alstom Transportation. Uh, we're both based in Derby, what was previously Bombardier Transportation. Um, as many of you will probably know, we got uh, acquired by Alstom earlier this year. So it's it's very much changing environment for all of us right now. Um, adopting an Alstom uh, way way of working and uh, and, and yet still delivering um, Bombardier products, which is um, it's a fantastic hybrid <laughs> of opportunity right now. So um, we're going to talk to you about uh, about what we do and uh, and the full scope of what uh, of what we offer within the UK, um, and that ranges from uh, design, manufacture, 
service uh, and maintenance uh, and the signalling now, um, signalling for Bombardier wasn't a massive opportunity within the UK but now we're part of the Arsenal organisation, uh, signalling uh, does form part of our, uh, our repertoire as it were. So, ah, this is a problem, my... Um, Elizabeth, would you like um, Isabella to take over and control yes, them? Yes, please, if you could, Isabella, this is um, my, my screen's frozen completely. Sure, give me one second. Thank you. Stop sharing. You made me feel better about my microphone issues, Liz. I felt like I was letting the side. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. This is why we always have a backup. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so um thank you. I'll hand over to Callum to introduce himself. Yeah. So I'm hi, I'm Callum. Um I've been at Alstom now for just over three years. I'm gonna jump around my face a little bit. Uh so I got into engineering at the ripe old age of eight. Um, when I went to a theme park and became fascinated by the roller coasters. Wouldn't go on them, but wanted to learn how they were made. And that's what that's where my engineering journey started. That took me to the University of Leicester, where I studied studied mechanical engineering uh, to a bachelor's with a year in industry and network rail, and then came out into, into Bombardier, now Alstom. Um, after doing spending two years on the graduate scheme, I came out as a planning and performance engineer, which is the role that I'm in at the moment, looking at how we do engineering, what processes we have, how can the tools be better um, to help make decisions easier. A little bit more on the personal side, I'm a massive fan of cricket, really happy to see Ben Stokes back in the Ashes squad, and I spend my spare time either watching Marvel and DC films or playing Dungeons and Dragons. Fantastic, thanks. Callum, um, so, um... I, um, I joined Bombardier um, the year before Callum on the graduate program as well, and uh, and the year after Ben. So we all, uh, <laughs> the three of us know each other fairly well. Um, I do like baking, as a lot of people in the office can attest. I have not helped their waistline since I started there. Um, I also love um, sewing and cross stitching as well. Um, I'm an avid volunteer, uh, particularly for STEM, uh, which uh, Callum and I will get into uh, in a little bit later. Um, most of my roles since I started with Bombardier about four and a half years ago uh, have been relating to uh, environments. Um, so I was part of the design for environment team, making sure that uh, everything that goes on our vehicles is um, legal, safe. Uh, and if there's anything else we can do with regards to chemicals that we're exposed to um, in our vehicles and, and what forms part of our, our vehicles. And that's where my chemistry background came in. Uh, and uh, more recently, I'm actually undertaking a green belt, not in karate, unfortunately, um, but uh, as a Six Sigma lean practitioner as well. So um, that's uh, hopefully going to be within the next six weeks. I'll get my qualification for that and then I can move on to my black belt. Um, Isabel, the next slide, if you could. You. Um, so as, as I've mentioned, we've got a strong UK uh, presence uh, as Alstom. The uh, the sites range all the way from Glasgow down to London. Uh, a lot of the maintenance uh, facilities for the different uh, different lines and operators that we uh, that we um, look after. The main manufacturing uh, and design site comes from Derby. Um, but also there is um, a site of witness which, uh, which has a lot of uh, technical input, um, particularly when it comes to our maintenance facilities such as uh, such as Health Hub, which I will also get into later. Um, next slide, please, Isabella. So we have a gate process that allows us to move in order from one stage of a project to the next when we design, build, test, and then send our trains out into service. Um, it ensures that we get the correct level of engineering at each uh, when we reach each point. Um, within the platform and sort of modular modular approach, the aim is to reduce the time it takes to start up and design a new project. Uh, essentially, the theory is that we carry over a number of requirements, hold it in the centre, and then when new projects come in, it's just the exceptional exceptional requirements that we look into in a bit more detail. Um, and in reality, even those some of those exceptional requirements can overlap um, 
and then if there's any last minute design changes for example we might need to go through a project gate again uh, next slide please so when it comes to bidding uh, in rolling stock it it does differ um ben talked about the weird way of uh, of uk rolling stock i think the weird way of rail as, as a whole is uh, is quite entertaining so um for those of you that may have come from automotive or uh, aerospace degrees um, and things like that those engineering aspects often design the product and build it and then and then sell it to their customer when it comes to rail the operators tell the manufacturers more what they want and and then it's a bidding process going yes we can do this uh, or we can sort of do this and we'll, we'll offer that instead uh, and then it's um and then ultimately it's what the operator wants at the end of the day as to who gets awarded that bid so um as you can see uh, the bidding process on the on the slide there um it is a project in its own right this can range from anywhere to a few weeks to years um in into getting this process right and um it's an incredible amount of interaction with the with the operator and the customer that you're uh, that you're trying to bid for to understand exactly what it is that they want ultimately they'll come with you with a series of requirements but as alongside that you'll also have all the various legal legislations that you need to um, abide by anyway and then you have to go through all this internal process to make sure that what you're offering is the the best thing you can possibly give to your customer but also in the best interest of the business as well and that's where creating the win strategy and the go no go decisions come in because this is a very delicate balance between quality time and cost and um, if you've not heard of it already you will um, soon enough QTC is uh, is pretty much a, a, a solid base for any uh, any business decision and depending on the business model for the company that you work for will depend on how that decision is swayed so you could have quite a low cost uh, model but the quality may be less for example or you can have a high cost model um, and uh, and deliver the the best quality and the highest quality to your customer. Um, often it is a middle uh, it is a middle ground. So as we're going through this bidding process, um, all of those decisions are made. There is a plan of what the bid will look like. Um, should you win, uh, and all those foreseeable um, occurrences and everything like that. Many interactions with the customer ability to ask them technical questions uh, and often that's based on a weekly meeting of our engineers asked us this what do you want uh, can you specify uh, can you be more specific can we understand this can we understand that and that's and that's where all these questions come in to make sure that you can deliver the uh, the best cost and best quality bid that you can finally that you submit the bid and then you're at the, the mercy of the customer as it were and uh, and you're waiting for their decision and that's where the NTP or the notice to proceed comes in once you get that note, um, then you're into the project phase and you can and you can get going. Next slide, please, Isabella. So I imagine that most of you are pretty familiar with the V cycle at this point. Um, but for those of you who aren't, I'll give you a quick sort of lean to on what it is before I go through this slide in any more detail. So you design down one side, starting big and ending small, and then you test and verify going up the other way starting small and going big towards the end it breaks out into five main groups of teams so you start with operability that's looking at vehicle wide systems and how they come together to work seamlessly across the whole vehicle and also with the network as well we need it to interact correctly performance um which is where we're looking more at the safety side uh, looking at the acoustics weight management making sure that vehicle meets uh, technical expectations across the whole vehicle functionality so this is your doors opening in x amount of seconds um ensuring that the train does what you need it to do architecture is where you get to the top level vehicle design so all the systems that have gone through operability performance and functionality where are they going to sit are they going to fit in with other with other parts of the train are they going to interrupt anything we've got to make sure that everything's separate or close enough that they interact correctly and then finally, subsystems. This is where you get your specialist engineering areas that focus more on knowing their systems inside and out, um, getting right into the technical side of things. So, for example, HVAC. After it's all been brought together, we, va we validate and verify up the other way. So we start with our subsystems, work through architecture and all the way up to operability. Um, we do this by submitting evidence of testing 
uh, design and functionality to numerous certification boards and also our customers to get it approved and enter services hitting all the requirements that are flowed down to us uh, at, the st at the start after bid phase. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, when it comes to manufacturing and test, um, both processes intertwine uh, when it when it comes to things and how we operate. At Derby, we do things slightly differently uh, as opposed to um, many other manufacturers around the world where we use a method called complete knockdown. Um, this method was devised um, through much analysis, uh, time-saving initiatives and things like that. And instead of having the full uh, sort of vehicle tube as you, you may be accustomed with and then filling it with our systems what we actually do is have our underframe our roof and our body sides all separate um, and have as many systems applied to them as we can before we bring them together at erection stage and then after erection we that's when we have our full tube um, that gets shunted down the line. We put our doors on and this is what's door stage. And here we have our water test, and which is a production line test to make sure, and it's a quality stock gap as well, that if there are any leaks at this point, they get to be addressed straight away before it gets too far down production and it could cause even further uh, damage, time, um, without the need to take things apart too much and, and we can address it there and then. After we get further down the process, we go to fit out and traction. And here, this is where um, heavier items on the underframe are installed. So things that couldn't be done at the underframe stage, um, uh, like batteries and, and uh, things like that. And then we have uh, fit out as well, where it's all of the interior components. So interior panels, um, uh, luggage racks, uh, draft screens and things like that. And then we do some various uh, just simple electrical checks as well. So um, particularly for Greater Anglia that have um, uh, heated flooring, we want to make sure that that's working <laughs> before it goes too far down the line. So we don't have to pull everything out and uh, and uh, and, re and uh, reinstall that and sort it out. And finally, the completion stage where the vehicle is shunted for one last time. It's on to prepare bogies, which is all connected up. And then at that last point, the um, the, the seating goes in. And after that, it's it's pretty much ready to go off the line. After that point, it goes through single unit testing. It's then coupled with the rest of its vehicle and becomes a complete unit. And then it comes through multiple unit testing. And this is all static and dynamic as well. At Derby, we're very fortunate that we have a test track that can reach about 40 miles an hour. Uh, so we can do a certain amount of dynamic testing straight on the site. Uh, and after that point, it goes to uh, testing facilities in, say, Ashbourne. Uh, where it has a full length test track and all the dynamic testing can be done there as well to make sure that it's uh, it's certified for customer sale uh, and to be on uh, network rail lines. And then there are also slightly more weird and wonderful tests that we do. So more of a one off is that is the picture you can see at the bottom of the screen is uh, the climatic chamber testing. So more often than not, this is uh, done in Austria, which is tends to be the nearest um, climatic chamber for us in the UK. And um, so it tests uh, down to freezing, hot temperatures um, for, for the UK. It tends to be sort of negative 40 to, uh, to plus uh, plus 45 uh, and just make sure that everything's okay so you can see our, our horn and how that's um, how that's uh, settling in there in the in the cold the, in the bottom corner we also have a test facility on site called train zero which again is is pretty unique to the country uh, and this is all of our software so down to the cable length that uh, will be installed on the vehicle this mirrors everything to do with the software and the facilities that we offer so um, it gives us a fantastic opportunity to test um, before it's installed on the vehicle to iron out any kinks and, uh, and make sure that the final software solution is working and fully compatible to uh, to what we want on the line which is uh, is incredible and um, and it does it, it helps us not only with new rolling stock but when it comes to um, upgrades as well and uh, and saves us a lot of time and money Thank you, Isabel. If you could do the next slide, please. So vehicles can be in service for up to or over 35 years. Um, during that time, they go through overhauls and upgrades uh, to make sure that they're still at the standard that is expected of them uh, and that they also still look pretty good. 
Um, service delivers a massive part of the business and it's actually where a lot of the profit can be made as well. Uh, so it's in our own interest as Alstom to ensure that we build quality vehicles that are durable and have long servicing parts so that they don't have to be continuously replaced more often than they should be. Uh, there are two main types of service agreement when a train's out, out on the network. There's a TSA, which is where the rolling stock manufacturer, Alstom in our case, delivers the maintenance of the vehicle. And then there's a TSSA, which we saw earlier in Ben's slide, uh, where we provide technical support to the operator, but the operator themselves complete the hands-on maintenance activities. Uh, next slide. Uh, so for this presentation, we were asked what our sort of future of rail thoughts were. And uh, after, Callum, after Callum and I had a little chin where we realised that we were very much on the same page. Um, so I'll go through the, the sort of top three points. Um, diversity and inclusion is, uh, is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I, I myself uh, are an ambassador for that within the Alstom organisation. And it's, it's very important to get new ideas from different people in um, and, uh, and ultimately help the business develop through bringing those ideas in. When it comes to uh, digital solution for services, so uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, the health hub for Bombardier, um, for Alstom and previously Orbiter for Bombardier, um, this is uh, a system that allows us to gain lots of information, thousands and thousands of points of information um, to what is happening to the vehicle whilst it's in service. And that allows react, uh, that allows um, maintenance to move from reactive to preventative and um, save money, save time and ultimately reduce waste um, and keep those vehicles in service for as long as we possibly can. And even though it's been about 10 years in the making it's still very much in its infancy it's not used to its full potential yet uh, and so very much the future of rail in my opinion there and very similar to cybersecurity, as, as I'm sure most of you will know, cybersecurity is a, a relatively new thing. And uh, as legislation increases and improves uh, in relation to what needs to be done and what should be done, um, the, the, the sort of bid work for older legacy uh, fleets and things like that will only increase. And, uh, and our awareness of that will need to be, uh, need to be very much there. Jumping on to STEM, uh, so it's so important for us to bring in fresh talent such as yourselves into the industry. Uh, it's a grassroots solution to ensure that every student in school has an understanding of where a career in STEM can take them and even rail can take them as well. Um, it's a big part of what both Liz and I do is looking at STEM and encouraging kids into into rail, um, trying to utilise what, what got us in and also what people are interested in. So, for example, taking my D&D &D out, of, out of work into work and thinking about how we can incorporate that so that we can encourage kids into into building trains um design for environment so uh, expectations are constantly changing uh for the way that we travel whether it be by train plane or car um and impacting the, the impact on the environment for each of these is is part of this um and so for this alston has developed the island a hydrogen fuel train uh which has come to the market and this, along with other projects that move away from the use of fossil fuels and um, unrenewable materials, uh, is a growing expectation from both customers and end user passengers as well. And then finally, platforms. As uh, I mentioned earlier, our, our methodology is a, is a project carryover in platform one. Um, and essentially, the, the whole benefit of it is to reduce the time it takes to design and build new projects so that we can get our trains out onto the network as fast as we possibly can. Um, and hitting the requirements and, and the safety that, that they need to be at. Um, that's an added benefit to not just us, but also our customers and makes the product more competitive as well. Uh, next slide. And that's it, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks Elizabeth, thanks Callum. That was, that was excellent, um, really interesting, especially for me as a non-rolling stock uh, engineer. And um, we have a couple of questions that have popped in. Um, so uh, Steve Moffat asks, uh, where do maintenance and turnaround considerations sit? I presume this is um, during the sort of design and manufacturing phase you discussed earlier in the slide. Um, Callum, if you're right, I'll take that. Yeah, it's fine. You go for it. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, it, it comes e even sooner than that. Um, so 
uh, for example, if we were bidding for um, new rolling stock contracts, um, often the, the bid for the services contract comes along with that as well, where those questions are asked uh, right up front. So um, we have in our engineering department, sort of design for maintenance, engineers, maintainability engineers, um, sitting there advising on those questions right up front so we know what to expect. Cool, thank you. And uh, one other question. Um, the software you referred to, um, uh, Sakib asks whether it's standardised and tested um, and is it used a lot and can it be added to, for example, could you code a situation into the simulation software? I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a software engineer. <laughs> Me either. So yeah, I would, um, if if I can take that question away, I absolutely will. So um, please do call, um, message me that and I'll, I'll find out a direct question for you, a direct answer for you. If any of the other speakers know, for example, Ben, and want to jump in, that'd be fine as well. If not, we'll take that one away. I will take that silence to know. Um, that puts us on time perfectly. So thanks again, guys. That was brilliant. Um, we're now going to hand over to Charlotte Hughes to talk about um, how to introduce a new fleet onto a line. Um, so if you want to come on, Charlotte, and then we'll give you control. Yep, so you should now have presentation rights. And you're just on mute at the moment, just so you know. Okay, are you seeing my presentation screen? Yep, you just need to go into slideshow and we're there. Okay. Oh, what, I need to switch my screens? No, no, we can see the uh, screen, but it's uh, um, it's not in slideshow mode. I don't know if I know what you mean. As in, I can see all the um, slides um, down the left-hand column. Um, that you're going to look at rather than it be a full screen slide. Ah, uh, okay. I have no idea how to change that. That's what it. What do you see now? Yep. So I've got uh, screen one, new trains. What is a train? Okay, great. That's what you should have. Perfect. Thank so, you. Let me move my face. Okay. So. Um, I haven't done a slide telling you who I am, uh, but my name is Charlotte Hughes. I am Associate Director at CPC Project Services for Fleet, and the current role I'm doing is Head of New Train Introduction at Southwest Rail. So my big new train introductions are the Alstom Class 701s and then the Viva Rail Class 484s onto the Isle of Wight, onto the island line. So anyone going on the tour in November, fingers crossed, you will see my trains in service there. So I'm going to start very basic, like very, very basic, and go through the things that I wish somebody had told me when I moved from signalling into rolling stock. So this isn't meant to be patronising. This is stuff I didn't know. So this is a train. This is also a train. And uh, the presenters before me, all having worked for Alstom and Bombardier, will recognize these trains. So now I'm going to go through. Um, oh, sorry, my screen. Sorry, I'm struggling for it to go through my screen. Right. Okay, so this is the characteristics used often to describe trains. So you'll hear them referred to as traction type, by traction type, sorry. So you'll have EMUs, so those are ones which have pantographs or shoe gear. As Ben spoke about, there's diesel units, you also have bi-mode and tri-mode, which have a combination of all of the above. Then you will also hear trains described by a class or their names. So you've got the class 70, uh, 710s that were also referred to as low train, 
low train being because it was trains on London Overground, very original, I know. And then you've got the class 701s that are going on to Southwest Rail, that Southwest Rail named the Arterios. Then finally, you'll hear people refer to units by unit length. And that isn't in meters, it's normally in cars. So for the trains on screen at the moment, you can see the top train is four cars long and then the bottom train is five cars long. Oh. Then these consists can work in multiple. So your top train, your low train comes in four car and five car variants, but they're operated in both eight cars, which is two fours combined or 10 cars, two fives combined with the when they are combined, you have buried cabs, which is where you can't walk through the whole um, consist. You can only walk through the fours. And then the 701s, as an example, come in two variants, five cars and 10 cars. Even though SWR intend to operate all of them as 10 cars, they've chosen to go for that flexibility of having the 10 being able to split into two pipes. OK, this slide is to demonstrate the key parties involved in the process of introducing a new train. So you have the organisations who decide that a certain area for UK is in need of a new train. Then you have the Roscoe's that are essentially the bank. They pay the billions of pounds up front um, for the train under the promise from either the DFT or the TFL that they will pay the lease on them in the future. Then you have the companies that manufacture the trains. And then finally, you have the train operating companies that operate the trains and they pay a lease fee to the Roscoe's for the pleasure of operating them. And that's generally the system of new trains. This is a very, very rough timeline of the train life cycle. I'll be focusing in on the introduction part of the process and I'll be doing that from the point of view of the talk. I'm very conscious that there'll be people on from Network Rail or the ORR or the train manufacturers who will have a slightly different slant on the introduction process. But as I say, I'll be doing it from the train operating company's point of view. As a side note, another thing um, before I go into new trains that I just wanted to discuss, because again, it was something I didn't know, is that fleets aren't built to operate solely on a certain part of the UK, or they don't tend to be. Fleets actually move around the UK. So the length of a franchise is normally around seven years. And as part of that franchise, they will choose to lease certain trains for that period. And then after that, that train could move to another operator in a completely other part of the UK. I will be focusing on the introduction of brand new trains, so trains straight out the factory, but the process I'll be describing isn't dissimilar to that of introducing an old train into a new part of the UK. One of the other things that I find particularly interesting about a new train introduction is I don't view it as a standalone project. New trains bring with them a major business change and affect the core operation of a train operating company and as such are best viewed as how you would view a systems integration project. Shown above in the colour boxes is um, the core work streams involved. And below that, I've picked out five of the main areas of new train introduction that I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on. So again, for some people on the call, this will be a familiar site. Um, on the left are the staff that require some form of training as part of a new train introduction. I've listed them from the, the most to the least amount of training generally. For example, where I'm at at the moment, at a talk like Southwest Rail, this accounts for thousands of members of staff to introduce the 701 alone. There's going to be around a thousand drivers that need training. The way that as part of an introduction, you determine what training is needed is you do something called an RBTNA, a risk based training needs analysis, which essentially the process involves working out what the delta between 
that person's current knowledge is and what they will need in the future and then working out how long it will take to train that. So I've got on screen here class 315 which were the trains that were operated by MTR drivers before the introduction of the class 345s which are the Elizabeth line trains. For a driver to convert between the class 315s to the class 345s it took them a five day traction conversion course. Most drivers traction conversion courses range from a few days if the change is um, less significant to up to a couple of weeks if there's a big change um, coming in with the new trains and as you can see there I would say those two trains have a fairly significant difference and that was only a five day training course. Okay, for these I have tried where possible to use my own photos but some of these photos are lifted from Google so apologies if anyone on the call is the actual owner of these photos. So the other major part of new train introductions is around infrastructure. When introducing a new train, the key element is compatibility, whether that be with the track and the signaling system, and that compatibility assessment is normally done with the manufacturer and network rail, or compatibility with the existing infrastructure, such as platforms, which is known as PTI, that's often done by the TOC. And with it often comes some changes, some more substantial than others. So I'm gonna go through, this is an, an extensive list, but it's the biggies. So you've got the dispatchers view. So the important factor here is, can the person that is saying that the train is safe to depart, see a clear, clearly see the entire dispatch corridor? So sometimes it will be the driver that needs to see that. And you can see in the top right where that's done through in-train cameras. Sometimes you'll have platform staff that give the driver um, the nod that the, tr the dispatch corridor is clear or you'll have a guard on board who does it. So as part of PTI, we check that whoever's role it is, they can clearly see the entirety of that dispatch corridor because PTI is the single biggest risk for TOX. Fatalities of passengers falling between the gap or being dragged by trains can often be linked back to blind spots, which could have been found during um, PTI checks. The next thing is stepping distance. So it's interesting that Ben has already covered that in his part of the slides. So another thing that is done at every platform is checking um, what the height and width is. And that there is a standard to follow and it is the TOX job where that standard isn't met to reduce the risk as much as possible. So as an example, on the Isle of Wight, we're introducing the class 484s, which were formerly the D stock. They are slightly taller than the old trains, so that step gap was deemed um, too high, so we've actually overlaid on the platform to reduce that step gap. Okay, the next element to consider is when you are running multiple length trains, there'll be different stopping positions within the platform, so those PTI checks do need to be done at all stop locations. Okay, and the next one is ramps. So there might be some people on this call who are innovative and there is definitely, definitely some money to be made here because with every new train introduction, you get a new ramp. They are unique to trains and at some stations where multiple trains stop there, you will see multiple ramps, which is, you know, we shouldn't be at that position still within the industry. Then the next element is gauging. Um, this is simply checking that the train isn't going to hit anything or it's not going to hit another train as it passes it. So in the top right corner here is a picture of how the gauging was previously done on the Isle of Wight. This picture was sent to me by a colleague 
and we think it was taken around 1967 when they introduced a new stock then but we can't properly date it and then the picture in the bottom left is how gauging is done now this was done in 2020 for the introduction of the new stock with lasers so you can see there is a little bit of innovation in the railway um, over the last uh, 50 years then the final things are CSDE, correct side door enable, um, and ASDO, automatic selective door operation. So generally with new trains, the business case for them is linked to passenger demand. So a driving force is making sure trains are longer. So it isn't uncommon to see trains now that don't fit in platforms. So what ASDO does is it locks out doors which aren't accommodated in platforms. Both CSDE and ASDO are driven by tags uh, down the track. So if the technology is new with the new train, those tags will also need fitting as part of the introduction and testing as part of the PTI. And then finally, you've got station lighting and customer information screens. Often these need renewing with new train introductions just because they're not always compatible with the old trains. So the UK in the last five years has seen a huge growth in new trains. Um, hopefully you will live on a line where you will see new trains. Um, the reason for this is the old trains were getting very, very old. And again, going back to Ben's slide, you can link that all back to the franchising and privatization. And maintaining the old trains was becoming more and more expensive to the point where buying new ones was cheaper. The government also changed the law in, on the 1st of January 2020 that all trains had to be compliant to legislation around persons of restricted mobility, PRM which would have been, again, such a costly overhaul for a lot of the legacy stock that it was deemed cheaper um, at the point that that legislation was written to buy new trains. The other reason was in the last 10 years, money is cheap from foreign investors. So we've seen a lot of new Roscoe's popping up with foreign investment because the leasing market is seen as a very good investment. What this does do is leave a number of um, old fleets with nowhere to go. The tocks are getting new trains and then the old trains haven't got a new home. Uh, land is expensive and there isn't a huge number of spare berths to park trains at night. When I, um, when I first moved to London and I noticed how many night buses there were, someone told me that the reason for that is that it's cheaper to run night buses than it is to find parking spaces for them um, all overnight. Unfortunately, in rail, we don't have that luxury. Every train every night needs to go back to its you know, parking space known as um, a berthing space. And just to give you a little idea of how much one of those parking spaces, berthing spaces costs overnight, for a top to privately um, lease additional berthing spaces um, on private land, you tend to range from about 500 to 600 pounds per train per night. Um, the variance is in the length of the train. So for tops during an introduction, it's a real careful balance of when do we send the old trains back? when we start introducing the new ones, because you want that period of crossover, but also things get congested really quickly. The other thing is, is the existing berth incompatible with the new trains? So 80% of the new trains are electrical, um, re some replacing diesel fleets, so not all legacy berthing is powered. Also the length, some of the berths are shorter than the new trains, so can't be used for the new longer trains. So to combat this, a lot of TOCs are building additional, sometimes depots, berthing to support this uh, overflow of trains. But then to get to the new berths, sometimes you have to employ extra drivers to compensate for driving that little bit further with empty trains at the end of the night or learning new routes. 
So that isn't necessarily a cheap, easy alternative. Then you also have to look at um, the maintenance regime of the trains and how can you maintain them on the new berths or the berths within the depot? Can you do heavy maintenance? Do you need to work at height? Where are the pit roads? That type of thing. Um, and then the more crowded the depots get, it's like one of those you know, slide puzzles. If the train you want to maintain comes in first and then loads of other trains block it in, it's an absolute pain moving everything about in the limited engineering hours. Then finally, I'm going to talk about um, functionality and reliability. So I've used these two pictures to illustrate the changing technology over time with new trains. So you've got the class four, by five, which as you can see, the driver mainly uses physical switches, levers, dials. Then I've compared that to the class 700s, where you'll see in the middle, you've got most of the controls go through um, the screens, HMIs, DMIs, they're called. And with this change in technology comes a change in the way you test the train. You know, we can all imagine how easy it is to test a physical button or a physical lever, but when that button is a push button on a touch screen, how do you check that that button works reliably? Do you press it 10 times? Do you press it a thousand times? Does it always come up when you open the screen? That level of testing and that type of testing of software is completely different to what we've been used to with legacy stocks in the past. I could um, talk about TCMS, train control management system testing for another hour, um, if you let me, which I'm not going to. Um, but I've come from an ATO signaling background. And one of the things I will finish on is um, rolling stock is definitely behind the curve when it comes to testing, in my opinion, testing um, safety critical onboard software. Um, I'd be interested after to hear what some of the uh, the Alstom representatives think about that. And then finally, when you introduce a new train into service, you will see in the Modern Railways publication, a table of performance. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting anyone cares about this, but I will say the class 710s I introduced are currently top of the list. Um, one of the other interesting things with this is, so you've got the measure of MTIN, which is miles per technical incident, which is sort of the currency most fleets use to say how reliable they are. Older fleets tend to average somewhere in the 30 to 50,000 MTIN, and for a new train, it can be years before they get anything above 15,000. So from a customer's point of view, we make, um, you know, a big song and dance about new trains and how great they're going to be. But actually, for the first sometimes years of introduction, their perception can be a lot of delays. So that's also something we have to consider when introducing new trains. And then the final area is maintenance. So with new trains um, often comes new maintenance regimes. And you can see the orange front on the class 710 there as well. Um, and that can often mean quite a lot of changes within the depot environment. So the Aventura trains, the Bombardier now Alston trains, have a lot of equipment in the roof, which means a lot of the depots have had to have more high level access. You have new frequency of regimes. So as we move to more preventative maintenance, the amount of time trains have to visit the depots changes, you've got tooling, spares, tanking, CET, the maintenance area is a huge change for a TOC if they are maintaining the new trains. Okay, so that was a bit of a whistle top, whistle stop tour into new train introductions. Is there any questions? Hi Charlotte. Uh... Thanks for that. What an excellent presentation again. Um, and as someone who hasn't worked on modeling stuff again, your um, your basic introduction to what a train is was really handy for me. Thank you. Um, what for you as a, a new train introduction manager is the biggest challenge in introducing a, a new fleet to a line? 
Okay, so it's something I haven't actually spoken about anywhere in the presentation, but that is stakeholders. Um, and by stakeholders, I mean um, our ASLEF and RMT colleagues. So the, the train for a lot of onboard staff is their world, it's their office. So they care a lot about the new trains and the old trains. So ensuring that they are happy with the new trains is a huge, huge element to the project and can be sometimes what the downfall of projects are. Great, thank you. And um, to get to the top of the reliability leader um, chart, as you've managed successfully to do, are there any uh, secret tips or tricks you might be able to share with the audience as to how you can manage that? Or, or is it uh, an element of extraneous factors, perhaps? Not to take any credit away. So, to be honest, I really can't take any of the credit um, <laughs> for um, the low trains performance because they're maintained by Alstom Bombardier, who built the trains. So it's them that deserves the pat on the back for that. Um, but it is nice to see one of the trains I've introduced doing well. Um, I think a lot of the things that lead to the new trains being reliable is within a platform like the Aventura platform is trying to, as new trains um, in that platform come out, try and push some of the learning down the chain. That's one of um, the big things. And if, the other thing I would say is the trains are very, very clever. On the Aventura units, the windscreen wipers themselves have an IP address they send back to the wayside how many times the windscreen wipers have moved that day. And from that, we should be moving more to then doing predictive maintenance, which is still something that we're not particularly strong at yet. Thank you. And there's a question from um, one of the delegates here, uh, Rodney. With the new technology um, coming up with new trains, um, what will the new challenges be for platform staff um, particularly for running safe operations? Mm, that's a really interesting one. So for platform staff, new trains, um, I wouldn't say have a huge, huge change for them. You've got the um, build lights above the door, the um, body indicate lights which show the status of the doors um, on newer trains. Those lights give better information to the platform staff than uh, the old trains do. So whether they're solid state or flashing will tell the platform staff if someone was trapped in the door, as an example. And then another key factor is the method of operation of the train. So. Some of the new trains will have body side cameras so that the drivers can see the um, PTI, uh, the dispatch corridor in the train. Whereas, say, trains like the 345s, they have platform based cameras. Um, so, just generally, the method of dispatch of the train will be of interest for the platform staff. <clears throat> Great. Thanks, Charlotte. I think that's all the questions we have. So, thanks again for your excellent presentation. And um, last but not least, now we're going to hand over to David Pierce, who's uh, going to talk about maintenance operations and also give us a tour of MTR. Hi, David. I'm just going to make yeah. you the presenter now. Can you see me all right? Hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Just want to apologise for the uh, um, slight <laughs> last minute change of plan <laughs> um, about the uh, my um, location. It, uh, everything fell to pieces in the depot on my computer, so I'm having to do it from home. Um, control, David. Yep, let's have a look. Let me just. Um, what can I show? Uh, oh, my settings are having a field day. One second, apologies. I should. If I press that, I'm not sure what you can see. Ah, screen two. See That's the ah. one. Uh, if I do this, yep. Uh, you, can you see that? Okay, cool. So on my screen, I've got presenter mode. Lovely. That's all good. Right. So um, 
Hi everyone, um, thanks for your time um, coming to listen to my presentation. Thanks for sticking around until the end and listening to me um, talk about fleet management. So I recognise there's been a certain amount of this which may have been repeated, so apologies if there is, um, but that was sort of what I'm trying to do is give an overall uh, perspective of, of what I do, um, of how things are managed from essentially sort of coming up coming off the back of some of the previous presentations and using the trains day to day. Um, so how do you manage the fleet from its introduction to what we call business as usual, uh, all the way through to uh, the withdrawal of the trains um, and, and everything in between? So, um, I, well, I suppose before I start, just a little bit about me. Um, so, as I say, my name is David Pierce. Uh, I am 345 delivery manager for MTR Elizabeth line. Uh, so my job, basically, to sum summarise it, is to deliver a safe, clean and reliable fleet every single day for our customers. Um, you may not have heard of the company MTR Elizabeth line. You may have done. Um, at the moment, we're currently branded as uh, TFL Rail. Uh, but that will start to transition over to the Elizabeth line towards the end of this year, start of next year, as we uh, move towards opening the central section of the Crossrail tunnels. So what is fleet management? Um, I've got a sort of, my presentation is based around a few questions, sort of what is it, what is it, what is it, you know, what are you talking about? Because I recognise there's there's a quite a broad audience on here. So, um, you know, forgive me for those who do have experience, but um, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's some some useful information in here for everyone. So, so first off, thanks to uh, my Aston colleagues for uh, for this particular image, um, which is basically just around maintenance planning, which is sort of the way that I see it is that maintenance is very much a planning led function. So, if you understand what the requirements are of the train, you know what you need to do to it. So, for example, our Aston colleagues when they build the train, they will say, "This is what you need to do." This is how often you mean to maintain it. These are the tasks you need to do. And then that's handed to us. We, and then we say, right, this is when it's last had this work done. This is when it next needs to have the work done. This is when it needs to come in. It all sounds very, very, very simple, but it's not. If it was that simple, I probably wouldn't be employed. <laughs> um, so as I say, yeah, as I've said here, it's a very, very broad topic. It incorporates everything fleet management. So this is the actual maintenance of the trains, um, allocating those trains on a daily basis so what i mean by that is we have services that go off the, um, the depot and out of the various stabling sidings and off stations uh, and we have to say what trains go where and when uh, when they do run those services things go wrong so it's what we call in-service defects so we have to manage that we have to make sure that there's space in the depot there's uh, resources in the depot You've got the people with the right tools in the depot. You've got the space in the depot in the in the shed or in the sidings. You can actually fit the train in the depot, which is one of the challenges that we have. Um, so all sorts of things. Life cycle control, which I'll kind of come on to in a minute. I've broken that down into a few different stages um, as well. Modifications, fairly self-explanatory, but some of the modifications you might do are, for example, you might do some data analysis, which shows you that your toilets are breaking more often. You might do some data analysis which shows that i don't know you have problems with your wheels or, or headlights just a rogue example um so you might do some research into what can you do to make that better what can you do to stop those breaking and that's one of one of my key messages if you're going to take anything away from this presentation is that maintenance and fleet management isn't about fixing things it's about stopping them breaking that's what we do if someone, if you ask an engineer, a maintenance engineer and an operator, what you do, if they say, I fix things, tell them they're wrong, what they actually do is stop it breaking. Because that's what we should be doing for our customers. And ultimately our customers are the fair paying public. Um, and yeah, just a, a key point at the bottom here, forgive me for looking at my sides, I've got my screens um, with the presentations on, but um, it's not an exhaustive list. This is, um, you know this is just a list of things that i could think of there are so many things i could i could talk for hours and hours and hours on everything but um obviously we're just here for a, for a brief introduction so what does the short term look like so well speaking of short term this was actually today i took this picture today this is uh train 31 uh today which was having a wheel set replaced um you'll see this in our depot tour a little bit later but what this is is it's called a bogey drop which forgive me if you if you did or didn't go through the architecture of a train earlier, but where you've got um, essentially where those little red, little yellow prongs go underneath the train, 
under there sits what you call the bogey, which has two wheel sets sit, um, fitted to it, and that's what supports the train. And on our trains, you know, you have you have the uh, the motors which power the train in there as well. Suspension, so the trains float on a bag of air, a cushion of air, um, and occasionally they need replacing. So part of the introduction, some of what was talked about earlier, the depot design was fitting this equipment into the depot so that you can easily remove them, do what you need to do, put on either a new one or put on the repaired bogey back in uh, as quickly as possible. So that's turned around in about, uh, it, theoretically, in about a day. Um, but that particular one took about a day and a half, which isn't too bad. So as I say, short term, so what do I mean by that? So daily, weekly, monthly maintenance. So just for want of a better term, turn the handle, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Make sure that the fleet is safe. You might have, so for our, our trains, we have a 105 day maintenance regime. For those familiar with maintenance regimes, it's essentially how often you service the train, like servicing your car. Um, so every 105 days, the train comes back for a check of increasing complexity up to the point when you come to overhaul the train, but I'll come on to that later. You have daily maintenance. So that's things like, so on some trains, you have to empty the toilets, refill the water. On our trains, particularly at the moment during autumn, uh, we struggle with uh, slippery rails, um, leaves on the line, as you would have heard, and we, we've had to fill up the trains with sand. We have constant monitoring. Our trains are quite sophisticated, so we have sensors which tell us when there's too, when there's not enough sand. So we can send the guys out, guys and girls out to uh, to refill the sand. Um, and then monthly maintenance. So well, as I say, ours is 105 days, uh, but on other fleets it's not. Monthly might be um, something slightly more intensive. You know, it might not just be replacing the brake pads. It might be changing all sorts of things. You might you might have to put in special tasks so certain things keep breaking. Optimization. Um, so you might you might have to maintain something on a, on a fleet every 30 days, typically by design. But you think actually these things aren't breaking. Do we really need to maintain these every 30 days, or are we just over maintaining? Are we over using our over stretching our resource? So that's when the likes of myself and all some of the technical engineers come in and they look at the they look at what's happening. They'll go and have a look, what we call go look see, and they'll check it and they'll say actually. Why don't we do a trial? Why don't we stretch it out to 60 days, for example? Why don't we do it every other time that it comes in? Um, and uh, and that's when you start to look at, actually, we can do that. We can make the depot more efficient. We can use our resources more effectively uh, and we can keep the fleet as reliable as possible. As I say, data analysis, I sort of mentioned this earlier about the fact that you use your data to, um, to really drive the performance and the reliability of the fleet. Um, I think increasingly these days, accurate data is important. If your data is not accurate, you're not going to get a good, reliable fleet. Um, we, have, we, we, we ensure we get to root cause of every single incident. If you don't, you'll end up with a load of nonsense that tells someone that you, um, you know, you, whilst you might be having a motor failure, actually it's nothing to do with the motors, it's something far, uh, further upstream that's causing the issue. Um, so you're forever gonna be swimming against the tide on that. Cleaning, as I say, um, so we need to make we, we make sure our trains are nice and clean. Our cleaning standards are quite rigorous, um, but obviously, you know, for, for every company, it's important. It's all about the image as well, but primarily about the um, the experience for the travelling public. And fuel costs, of course, you know, diesel trains, for example, need to be refuelled. Some of them need to be refuelled every day. Medium term. So this is. Slightly longer, so um, obviously this isn't one of our trains. This is where I start to talk about more of the, the wider industry as a whole. So you'll start to think about overhaul, which is basically you're sort of replacing some key components. You might be looking at air hoses. You might be looking at um, some of the bogies you might replace. They might have a periodicity at which they need to be replaced. Refurbishment, so for example, this image, I believe if my train spotting is, is accurate, I think that's a Mark IV when they're having the interior refresh. So, you know, you might refresh things like the carpets, you might repaint the interior panel, replace the seat covers, things like that, just to give this train a bit more of a spruce, um, which I suppose is covered under refurbishment as well. Um, facilities development. So for that, I'm referring to more to the depot side of things. So as I say, the fleet management isn't just about the train. It's about the, everything that supports the train as well. So the bogey job that we have, some companies don't have that. 
you might say actually we need that to improve the efficiency of our sites because we, we can't do this in any other way we can't send it off to do something or we can't use um, some synchronized jacks which I'll show you later um, we need to install a bogey drop so that might be something that they decide to bring in that would be a shorter term than the full life of the train potentially to bring that in um, so that's why I put it into medium term large modifications I suppose you know comes into overhaul but you know you, things which might be slightly more invasive so for example you might be I don't know installing a toilet changing the toilet type taking the toilet out um, all sorts of different things and supplier management um, because a lot of I suppose a lot of trains at the moment rely on certain suppliers or legacy components older components but increasingly things are going obsolete um, and so you need to start looking at the longer term of who can who can produce this who still exists that can produce these components who can who has the expertise to do these things um, to ensure that we keep our safe clean reliable fleet so so the long term um, life cycle management which I'll come on to um, uh, and this is looking at so what what do we do with our trains this is where um as was referenced earlier about the roscoe's the owning companies of the trains they, they they all look at the train and so how can i get the maximum value out of this train for the longest time i can how can i eke out 40 odd years of life out of this train so for example this image is uh, one of southwestern railway's recent projects successful or otherwise i will retain refrain from my, my view but um Obviously, it, the idea being that these trains, which could have been scrapped, were going to be repurposed, fitted with new traction equipment, new interiors, um, because otherwise it was going to be redundant. But there was a demand elsewhere for, for, for modern trains. Um, so in theory, you know, the idea was a fantastic one. Um, but likewise, you know, as, as we said, the trains aren't designed for a specific purpose necessarily. I, I suppose guilty as charged with my fleet is that they potentially are. But the majority of trains on the main line aren't and so you might see a third rail train with a pantograph well in it because the owner's gone well what if it's needed elsewhere what if someone else wants it that has overhead line and not third rail so all those kind of things that you're thinking about the longer term repurpose so a good example that was used earlier was the island line as well um you know that's a, an underground train now used on a surface line um so different things like that and disposal which is the slightly sad part, um, I, I tried to find a train that not too many people would be disappointed about um, being disposed of. Uh, obviously, some paces there getting um, read their last rights. But you know, you might you might have a disposal, for example, of a train if their life expired. They might be rusty. Their facilities might be outdated. People might hate them. They might have a bad reputation. That's typically not one of the primary reasons of withdrawing them. But you know, if if you've got all the value out and it starts to become not financially viable to maintain that train or refurbish that train or repurpose that train then it might be the decision is made to to dispose of it uh, as i say no demand so i use the example of again for the spotters amongst you the class 365s theoretically a perfectly good train but there's not the demand or the use for them at the moment so the decision is made to sort of dispose of them which is obviously a shame but those are the times that we're in at the moment but ending on a good note on that particular bit is the preservation so for, for, again for those enthusiasts put a nice shiny picture of a, a high-speed train on there which has been preserved which is a, which is obviously great to see um some of our heritage preserved um but yeah so it's not always into the scrap heap which is good i sort of covered some of this so i won't bore you anymore with this um these are a couple of projects so the 769 used to be run on the thames link route that's now converted to a bi mode so they'll have diesel engines underneath it as well uh, and the Renatus project for the class 321s, which is something that I personally worked on uh, more once they come into service to try and keep them running. Um, but that's sort of fitting air conditioning into a, a 1990s era train and a few other things, shiny things. Again, new train introduction. So this is obviously very, very familiar to, to all of the slides you would have just seen. Um, but this is when we were doing some um, route proving for our class 345s, um, testing the ramps. Uh, and also what this is, this is called a, a rotakin. Forgive me if that was uh, mentioned earlier, uh, but this is testing the cameras and making sure that you can see a sort of model of a person at various places, which is in compliance with various standards. Uh, so obviously, I, as I say, I had to sort of run from central London to make sure I was here on time, so forgive me, but I understand some of this was shown already. Um, but really what, 
I wanted to just say here is that, you know, you've got some of the others are talking about design and manufacture of trains, the introduction of trains. So in the whole life of the train, what I've really been talking about is on the right hand side. So a very, very small part of the whole life of the train. Um, but it's obviously a very key part of the train and a very long part of the train, um, but a very sort of it, it can be it can be looked at very simply. But um, I recognise that the V model can be a little bit more based on software and things, but it felt like a good a good analogy that I like to use. So this brings you to the bit where you have to stop probably looking at my face so much. And I let's try and get out here and show. I can show you the video. Now, Paul, can you just let me know how well you can see that? Um yeah, Not it's well almost enough. it's almost full screen, Dave. So hit play, let's have a look. Okay, cool. Apologies if this is if this is difficult for anyone to see, um, but it's been challenging. So, um, first of all, welcome to Aldo Common Depot. Actually, is, are you looking more at my face, Paul? Sorry, or is it full screen for you? Did you say? No, no, it's uh, it's a good size screen. Cool, cool. Okay, yeah, welcome to Aldo Common Depot. So this is based over in um, West London in Acton. Um, this is the home depot of the Class Three Four Five fleet for the Elizabeth Line. Uh, the depot was built only really opened in 2018, I believe. Um, so it's only three years old, um, so it's all still quite nice and shiny and new. Uh, that's how I like to keep it. Um, but we work here on um, alongside Alstom, who are our maintenance provider. So everything you see here realistically is controlled by Alstom, is performed by Alstom, um, but we are the customer. So we maintain a presence on site. Uh, we make sure we tell them whether we're happy or not with what they're doing, um, and all those kind of things. But it's very much a partnership working together. So let's take a walk through and I, looking at the screen, it looks like it might be a little bit jerky, but I will pause at the important bits. Um, so we'll just go through the reception, which is one of the less important bits. Um, and I'll just pause it here. So this is the entrance into what we call the OMC, which is the Operational Maintenance Center. Um, so this is now this has changed a little bit since um, since I took this video. Um, where we do the sort of morning briefing meetings at half past seven. You have the technicians, you have the team leaders, the production managers, uh, all meet to discuss the activities of the day, what maintenance is going to be done, um, what contractors you might have on site, um, and uh, any safety issues, uh, what we call MIEs, which is a maintenance induced error, anything sort of lessons learned from that, um, and, and looking at the plan for the next 24 hours as well. Um, so we'll carry on walking along. I can't remember how long this bit is, so you'll have to just enjoy the journey along. So this is one of our class three, four, fives. And as you can see, there are these sort of vertical, well, oh, I'll talk, you, talk to you about this bit first. So on this bit on the left-hand side is our uh, wheel set store. Um, this again is moved uh, as a piece of learning from uh, some recent uh, activities that we've done to increase safety, um, but essentially, we make sure we hold enough spares for the train uh, for whatever eventuality, especially at the moment with uh, low adhesion, as we call it, slippery rails, you can get flats on the wheels. Um, so it's important to have enough spares so that you can change them out quickly and you can uh, maximize the amount of time that the train is out and uh, in revenue service. Uh, we have this thing on the floor called, uh, it's, it's a turntable. It's quite fortunate to have this really because not every, not every depot has one. Um, it, it essentially, it's probably fairly self-explanatory, but it enables you to wheel the wheel sets onto there or the bogies onto there, turn them around and uh, and position them on whatever roads they need to be on. So we'll conti continue our little walk up. We actually have spares in here from other depots as well. Um, and I'll finish it on a little bit, slightly less fuzzy bit. So on the left hand side, you will see the um, these vertical yellow columns, which is our uh, synchronized jacks. So what these do is they slot under each coach uh, and, and every single one lifts up at the same time. So you can lift a full nine car train, uh, which is 205 meters long uh, at the same time to do whatever you need to do underneath it. it. Might be a component replacement, it might be whatever. So we'll continue along here. 
or just keeping one eye on the time pool. So if I'm running a bit uh, slow, please do just shout. Um, but this this is part of the um, sort of part of the, the green initiatives that we've had that, that, that were kept in mind during the uh, uh, the build the, the design and build of the depot. So you might think, you know, why is he showing me some weird pipes? Well, how could that be to do with um, uh, you know being green and environmentally friendly? But essentially, what this is is underfloor heating. What this does is there's water circulated through these pipes through deep boreholes under the ground it uses geothermal heating to heat the water brings it up and then is circulated around underneath the uh, underneath the floor of the depot to keep it nice and toasty so what you won't see it, it whereas you might see in other depots um you won't see the overhead heaters uh which are very inefficient uh waste a lot of energy um, and so these, this is all part of reducing the energy consumption of the depot, which uh, I found quite interesting. It's quite an unusual feature, uh, but hopefully one that's initiated uh, will, um, you know, be used a lot more in in the future. I will just skip forward a bit to here. This is the slightly more interesting bit, I'm sure. So this is a uh, basically the overview of the front of the the depot. This is the you know the main shed. Uh, I call it a bit of a cathedral because it is, um, you know, it is a huge space. It's, uh, there's seven, what we call roads. You've got MIC one to nine, which is M1, M2, but uh, using your phonetic, phonetic alphabet as they like to. Um, and then outside you've got Sierra 10 to Sierra 43. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of lines in the depot, um, but it's, this is our key maintenance and st storage hub. So each of the each of the different roads has a slightly different function. So here is the bogey drop, as you will hopefully remember earlier from when I was showing you that picture of train 31. Um, what happens here is that the, the train will all roll over it. As I say, this section will drop out from underneath, whisk away the uh, the wheels, and then bring up the nice shiny new ones. And we're very very fortunate in that we have two. For those who haven't been. This is our, um, these are our light maintenance roads. Um, so this is more akin to what you would have in a, for want of a better term, a normal depot. Um, so you've got the, the swimming pool pits as we call them, where the trains drive over and they good, have good access to the underneath. Uh, and then we have two roads on the left-hand side, which are for light maintenance and uh, looking at the roof on these gantries. Just conscious of the time, so I'm going to skip ahead to this is a door training rig for anyone interested. Uh, I will go back one second to this, which is one of the most important pieces of equipment we have on the depot. So, you know, I was talking about wheels having flats, wheels having damage. This is what's called a wheel lathe. For those who don't know, um, it's fairly self-explanatory if you know what a lathe is, um, but essentially you drive your train over the top of this, it will lift up the wheels slightly, turn them, and there's a metal cutting head which will cut into the wheels ever so slightly and uh, make sure that they're round again um, you resurface the the um the wheel it's a bit like changing a tire on a car but it's a, instead of putting new rubber on it you basically skim the surface of the wheels off and then they're all nice and round and, uh, and everyone's happy and the customers have a nice comfortable ride and it's safe let's see ah oh, yes this is the simulator so this is what the drivers can train on before they're allowed out onto the main line. Um, this is an exact replica of the cab of the train um, using all the same panels from the factory and everything. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Apologies for the slightly juddery image. You can see a bit like the 700s in uh, a previous slide. This was... Um, this is a lot of displays rather than a lot of mechanical levers. For those for those interested, for those uh, experienced amongst you, um, we actually manage the simulator as another train. So we treat, whilst we have 70 physical trains, uh, we manage it as a fleet of 72. So we have a 34500A and 34500B, which are the two simulators, um, so that uh, we make sure that they're delivering them well. and reliably just a couple of shots of the outside of the depot taking a stroll along people watching me wondering why i was filming 
Um, and, and that's, you know, that's about it. I think I included some of the, I'm not sure if I included some of the bird scarer. I did, but I won't bore you with the bird scarer. Essentially what this is, it's quite an important piece of kit. I'll, I'll just finish on this note. It's a bit of a strange one to finish on. But essentially what this is, 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 is a deterrent for one of the biggest issues we have at the moment, which is birds flying underneath um, the overhead line, getting electrocuted and burning holes in the roof of the train, which is yet another, you know, yet another issue that we have to face and deal with. So fleet management, as I say, it's not just about the trains, it's about everything around it. So I hope, Paul, I'm running to time and I've finished at the right time. Um, forgive me for the slightly roundabout view of everything, but it, it is a big area. If anyone's interested and wants to hear a little bit more, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, please do get in touch. Um, I'm not sure, Paul, if you're circulating the details, but you know, if anyone is, please do feel free to get in touch. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks very much for listening. And has anyone got any questions? Thanks, David. Excellent presentation. Um, and I enjoyed the virtual tour of the depot again, as last time. Um, we have one question um, that's come in from Tadala, um, which is more about general fleet, I think, um, which is, would there be Euro style, sorry, Eurostar style trains introduced into UK routes with more luggage space? Um, I think the answer to that is there already exists, but I'll let you go into that. I, I think it's, I guess, we, wearing my pedantic hat, it sort of depends on what you mean by Eurostar style trains. But if, you know, if we're talking about luggage racks, I think increasingly it's becoming evident that people are switching from planes to trains. I mean, if you, if you listen to today's budget, you might think otherwise, but um, you, you look at the launch of the Lumo service for anyone who covered that, uh, who was interested in that. There was people with luggage all over the place, you know, people switching from the likes of EasyJet to a low cost rail company um, and, and people using it for leisure travel. And I think with with the change in the demand from COVID to, um, you know, more less from commuting and more to leisure travel, I, I think it's only a matter of time. I, I think, I, you know, I can't comment for what's going to come in the future, what the owning companies and the financiers want to do with their fleets going forward. But I think it's only a matter of time and people are taking notes. I think someone might be able to correct me, but I believe LNER actually took some seats out to put more luggage racks in for that exact reason. Um, so yeah, I, I, I very much believe so. Great, thanks Dave. That That's all the questions we had. Um, if anyone didn't get a chance to ask a question today, feel free to drop me or one of the organizers an email and we'll, we'll try and come back to you. Um, so just to say thanks so much again to all the presenters today for, for an excellent, um, event um genuinely really interesting i i learned tons as an on-rolling stock engineer um with limited knowledge and i hope lots of you did as well thank you also to our attendees um for joining us today i realize five to seven isn't the most social time sometimes to be attending these events um but we hope you got lots out of it and just to note we do have a next event um next wednesday which is a look at track and infrastructure if you're interested please attend and we'll also be putting this uh whole presentation online on YouTube. I'm reliably informed that one of the earlier presentations to Q&I with senior leaders is up um, and we'll be putting this one and the history of trains up, uh, history of railway, sorry, in the UK up soon. So thanks very much everyone. I'm going to close the event now um, and see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.